MASH was a phenomenon. 11 seasons, 256 episodes, and more than 100 Emmy nominations. And at its core was Alan Alda. The character of Hawkeye Pierce was emblematic of the struggle between comedy and tragedy. You ever get the feeling there's a war going on? There's always a war going on. War is the world's favourite spectator sport. And it made Alda one of the most successful actors and writers we've ever known. I wanted to be a writer from the time I was eight years old. Uh, and I wanted to be an actor from the time I was nine. His is a career that seemingly refuses to cease, but remarkably, there is even more behind the kind face and joyful <laughs> laugh. Alan, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for joining us on The Weekly. Thank you. You've had such a, a wonderful career in showbiz, but you, you grew up around showbiz. Your parents worked in burlesque and, and you were growing up side of stage. Did you get to learn all of your tough showbiz lessons at an early age? Well, I did uh, in the sense that I, I watched my father uh, from the wings from the time I was about two or two and a half, and he was in burlesque. So I learned a great deal in those days. <laughs> it gave me a lifelong interest. And did you, did you travel with your parents when, when they were working in the I theater? did. I did. Uh, we would go by train everywhere, uh, up and down the eastern coast, all the way up to Toronto, um, until my father and his comedian partner wrote a sketch that involved a small pig. And, and he, my father came out on stage at the end of the sketch carrying this live pig. And that was supposed to be hilarious. And in order to get from town to town, they then had a car. And they had room for my father, his partner, my mother, and the pig. And they didn't have room for me. <laughs> I so, hated that pig. <laughs> so you got bumped for a pig. I did. I think that was my first lesson, harsh lesson in show business. <laughs> And have you ever been beaten out by a pig uh, since? No, I've, I've seldom been replaced by an actual pig. <laughs> <laughs> you opened one of your memoirs with the line that y your mother didn't try to stab your father until you were six. Mm. And I laughed out loud reading it because it's a beautifully funny sentence, but it's hand in hand with a the sadness there yeah, as well. Yeah, well, it's true. My mother, my, unfortunately, my mother uh, was schizophrenic and paranoid and... It was unfortunate for her and for my father and me. She, she never, the whole, almost the whole time I knew her until her death, she was uh, afflicted with this depression as well. It, it, was a, it was a hard thing to have as a child. But I think on the bright side, for me personally, not for her, her life was very unhappy. But for me, I think it made me observe people which helped me as an actor and a writer because I had to always figure out from the time I was a little kid, is this reality what I'm hearing or is it just her reality? Because, you know, she'd say, look, the cracks on the wall, they're taking our picture through the wall. Wow. And then she was telling me I was trying to kill her some, you know, very often. And that kind of, so it was, uh, it, was, it was, you had to be quick on your feet to get along with her. But also I imagine a sense of humor is, is one of the most important things you can have through that. Yeah. And by the way, she had a sense of humor. She liked to laugh. She loved me. She, I mean, I was, I felt completely loved by her. So it wasn't, it wasn't that horrible, the childhood. It was just difficult. And so how, how did you and your father navigate that? And what did that do to your relationship with your father? You know, those were the days, this might be hard to believe, but those were the days when you didn't talk about mental illness, even in the family. I suppose there were some families that were maybe better educated and more sophisticated and could I talk about it. I think we're still learning now. We're still yeah, learning so now to be able true? to talk about it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not a good idea. It's good to talk about it because it's only an illness. It's not a character flaw. She wasn't a bad person. She was ill. And it was difficult to live with her. And finding out how other people handle those problems would be a good idea. Get a few tips for living. Mm. And you and your father never got to have that conversation? No, never. It strikes me that that balance of, of the, the humour with the sadness is, served you very well for, for MASH, which is yeah, essentially is at the core of it. Yeah, it's all my life. And maybe you're the first person to point that out to me. How that much can, do you that want, cannot be true. How much do you want for this session? Wow. <laughs> no, I, it, it's true. All my life I've, I've valued uh, plays or dramatic writing that was both funny and also so serious it recognized that we're all going to die, you know? Yeah. And, and the laughter is an antidote to that, or just a way of connecting. The DVD of, of MASH, the DVD box set, 
that I own has a choice and you can listen to it with the laugh track or without the laugh track right. as a bit of an extra. Was there always a tension in creating the show between the laughter and the seriousness? Well, we were very glad to see that in uh, Great Britain it was played on television without the laugh track. Altogether? Yeah. And we, uh, the producers of the show, kept the laugh track minimal as much as they could. The, the network always insisted on it. They, I guess they felt that 200 million Americans needed to know when it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and interestingly, it was kept so muted that after the second or third year, some people would say, how come you suddenly added a laugh track? Because once in a while, they weren't laughing and drowning out the fake laughter. Yeah. And they suddenly heard it. Um, we also, I think we got them to agree that in the operating room, there wouldn't be a laugh track. So then we spent more and more time in the operating room so we could avoid the laugh track. <laughs> but it's not like you held back on on humour in the operating room. Some, no, no, some no. of the best jokes yeah. were under the pressure of those situations. Which is what doctors tell us, surgeons tell us, is the way operations take place. So how was the operation? Well, it was very, very funny. Very but funny. Terrible operating. outcome. Yeah, we killed them. <laughs> So for the final episode of MASH, my parents threw a MASH party. Uh, they had all their friends over. We all wore army outfits, drank martinis. <laughs> yes. How, how was the last episode for you? The, the last episode was yeah. very different for us. We didn't really understand how popular the show was. And the last episode was something we watched on a big screen at the studio. It was, an, it was a, a goodbye moment for all of us. Then we got in cars and went to a restaurant to have dinner. And on the way to the restaurant, I said to Loretta Swit, Loretta, look, look, look at the streets. The streets are empty. There are no, there's no traffic in the, in the road. And it was at that moment that we realized that most everybody was home watching us on television. Mm. Half the country was watching all at one time. In New York, so many people got up during the commercial to go to the bathroom that the waterworks started to break down. <laughs> I never had a salute like that. <laughs> do, do you ever feel that you missed out on, on just watching it? I probably would have been a fan of it. It's, it was a good show. We were very, all of us, very lucky to be involved together and with such important material. Based on the suffering and the, and the, uh, the stories of real people. You know, the, the surgeons, the soldiers, the, those people really lived. And we tried to make it as close to their real experience as we could. And when some of the producers went over to Korea after a couple of years, they found out that stories we had made up had actually in some version been lived out by the people there. And we didn't know it. But we interviewed hundreds of them to find out what their lives were like. And they must have appreciated that. I think they did, yeah. You know, the most touching thing that I think I've heard about the show is that young women who were girls at the time only had a close relationship with their father, only had a, 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 a breakdown sometimes in the silence between them when they watched the show together, and, and especially if the father would break down in tears. It, was, it, it opened people up who had been through similar experiences. Now, that was a very moving thing to hear. Absolutely. Something that people would be less familiar with possibly is your passion for science. You're in Australia for the, for the World Science Festival. Yes. What was the moment that first fired your, your passion for science? Oh, I, when I was a little boy, I, I used to do what I thought were experiments. And, uh, so did I. They always got me in trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would mix things that didn't go together, or try to anyway. It wasn't until after I got out of college that I started reading because I was just very curious. I was reading everything I could about science. And when I write theater pieces about scientists, I try to tell the dramatic story of what Einstein's life was like, what Marie Curie's life was like. Because if we can see them as fellow people, then we might be a little more interested in what they accomplished. That, that marriage of art and science is, is on full display with, with your play Dear Albert. Right. And a lot of people know certain things about Albert Einstein. He was crazy smart, E equals MC squared, didn't comb his hair well, poked his tongue out that time. People, <laughs> you know, people know Einstein. Yeah. But what is it about him that you find fascinating that you want people to take from the play? 
I think it's really important, especially with somebody as universally recognized, as brilliant as Einstein, that we understand that he was also a human. He had human flaws, human attributes. And you see them in the letters between him and his two wives. He was both loving and atrocious with <laughs> at least one of them. There's one letter in particular that features in the play that I found really hilarious. I have to have someone to love, otherwise life is miserable, and this someone is you. Let me categorically assure you that I consider myself a full-fledged male. Perhaps I will sometime have the opportunity to prove it to you. He's being romantic, but he also just sounds like he's trying to prove a scientific theory about love. What a pickup line. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to prove it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to prove to you that I'm actually a full-fledged man. Yeah. I wrote a play about Marie Curie, the same thing. I wanted thing. to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to do her letters because I, she has such an interesting story. Then I found out that her letters are in the Paris library and they're still radioactive and you have to sign a release before you touch them. So I switched to Einstein. <laughs> so, so in, in self-interest, self-preservation. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and it's funny, I, I, when I wrote to Paul Rudd, who, who was wonderful reading, I, you would, I wouldn't think, you would, you, people might not think Paul Rudd would be good as Einstein, but he was so wonderful. And I wrote him this letter saying, please think about playing Einstein at the, at the festival, which he did in New York. And a wonderful uh, Australian actors will read the play here. Uh, so I said, will you do it? And he wrote me back. He said, you had me at Eagle MC Squared. <laughs> <laughs> You've described Marie Curie as, as one of your heroes. Yeah, she was a hero of mine because she never gave up. She had everything against her. She, they didn't want to give her the Nobel Prize specifically because she was a woman. They wanted to give it to her husband who had just half the credit for discovering radium and for the work on radiation. And... Even, even, even then, after she won the first prize, they didn't want to give her the second prize because it had come out that she had had an affair with somebody after, after Pierre, her husband, was dead. She was facing constant rebuke for being a woman. But in, in spite, even if she didn't face that, she shoveled, physically shoveled, a, about seven tons of ore in order to boil it down with poisonous fumes coming up into her nostrils to find radium at the bottom of all of that. Nothing stopped her. And in the writing of the play, it's hard to write a play. And I sometimes felt like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. This is too hard to do. And I thought, Marie wouldn't quit. <laughs> <laughs> they were very different people. Einstein and Curie were very different people, but they were quite close. Einstein, you know, who fancied himself a ladies' man, he spent some time with Marie Curie walking around in the mountains, hiking. And later when she was rumored to have an affair, which she did have, mm. Einstein said, I don't believe she's having an affair. She has all the appeal of a herring. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I, on the other hand, in writing about her, fell in love with her. My wife is okay with that because Marie has been dead for over 100, um, about 50 years. That's a, that's a safe leave pass. Marie Curie is a safe leave pass from Yes, from right, wife. yes, yeah. <laughs> Do you think, uh, given her mistreatment purely because of her sex, do you think we've necessarily come so far since then? If you, if you have a look at... Well, that's very interesting. A hundred years after Marie was excoriated for being a woman by the French press. The American press said of Hillary Clinton while she was running for president the last time, one, one writer in the press said, Hillary learned in this campaign that she can't look too ambitious. The word ambitious was the wow. exact word used against Marie Curie a hundred years earlier, that very word. What's wrong with a woman looking ambitious? Shouldn't we all be ambitious? I mean, do you want somebody to not be ambitious to use her talents? Well, that's a little crazy. And downright un-American, well, if nothing else. Supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy Smits, who eventually became President Santos in the West Wing, ran against yeah, I know, your character. I, could, I couldn't Penny. understand that. Even, even though we had shot the show, while I was still watching, disappointed, I was watching the show at home, and I saw the returns coming in, and I thought, I still have a chance. Yeah, I did good in the debate. I did great in the debate. I know. What's the matter? <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But I have a question. In 2008, Jimmy Smits went out on the campaign trail yeah. to support Barack Obama. Any any thoughts that Arnie Vinnick might get out and support Donald Trump if he's the nominee? <laughs> no, I, Arnie Vinnick, I doubt would, and I I don't. Um, would he be I, an elder statesman who'd be called on now to? Yeah, to yeah. criticize Donald Trump. But I, I decided after I campaigned for ten years for the Equal Rights Amendment that I gave it the office, and I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't do politics. We'll leave it there, Alan Alder. Thank you so much for your time. I just appreciate Thank it you. so much. Thank you very much. 